War is never good for anyone about what's happening in Israel at the moment. We have enough weaponry, we have enough military to eliminate Gaza in a blink of an eye. And if you'd go to Iran and say you're gay, you'd be slaughtered, posing your sexuality too much and people would throw rocks on you. Tel Aviv became that gay friendly now. The gay capital of the world. The one place where you can just be yourself, have fun. What I love about this country and whatever I had read about it always seemed like it was the LGBT haven. And then I'm sitting in a cafe in, in Himachal Pradesh in Dharam Court and this very good looking man with some very interesting chest hair and, and, and a gorgeous smile decides to walk around me. And that's how Omri and I have briefly had an interaction. In true, How's it was it nice going? interaction indeed. Welcome to the Big Pucci podcast. Thank you, brother. I'm glad you know, to be here. So you, you mentioned you're from Israel. Indeed. And I have a whole bunch of questions about what's happening in Israel at the moment. And that is a conversation which I'm really hoping you can help me understand. Because in our lifetimes, it's the biggest conflict we've seen. Definitely. But before we get into that, the one very interesting thing you told me was the fact that public perception today around Israel is so different because what we're hearing on the news media is perhaps very far removed from the reality of stuff. Indeed. Right? I think the media just want to have their own opinion and plant it into your head. Uh, but most of the time, it's very far-fetched from the truth. I think this topic is so interesting because these days, with all what's happening in Gaza, people think that Israel is like a very radical place, a place that doesn't give like um, minority their, their rights, doesn't give gay people their rights. And that's like so annoying because this is so far from the truth. I think Israel is the one place in the Middle East that do give those rights to all those minorities, even if you're gay or even if you're poor, black, whatever, we don't discriminate in Israel. So it's so difficult to me these days to hear those opinions around me, people thinking that Israel is this dark place, which is just the farthest it can be from the truth. So let's get to the truth, because, you know, what you hear on the news media very often is heavily doctored. It comes with agenda. But when you're a citizen of a country and there's no other objective, what you will really tell me will be the absolute reality of what you really Indeed. look at every day. Let's start with the fun stuff. OK, yes. um, as somebody who is who is a bisexual man, I live in this country. I am fairly well known in my circles. I'm also an LGBT activist in this country. One of the biggest um, one of the biggest steps for us as a country was when our government went out and decriminalized homosexuality. So it's not to say that legalized marriage, no matter how attractive I think you are, if I want to marry you today, the, the government of India today will not allow me that. Um, he said something very cool. He said, you know, if you're in Tel Aviv, it's like the gay capital of the world and you can do whatever you want. So t tell me about that. Okay. How, how, how vibrant is that? Okay, Tel Aviv is extremely vibrant. The last I think, few decades, Tel Aviv became one of those places people from Europe come, from the States, they all come to party, to feel free, to spend time on the beach. Now, the fact that we have the beach means most of the people around, well, I guess in summertime, will walk without a shirt. It's very hot, it's very pleasant. Each can just be himself. Now, I'm not gonna say it's like that in all over Israel. We have the religious places where those kind of behaviors are not very welcome. Uh, but Tel Aviv specifically is the place where you can just be yourself. Um, you see it on the street. I mean, you just need to, to scroll down the streets and, and you'll see people in so many colors dressed as the way they like. Um, we have gay party, we have gay pride. Um, well, I'm not gay, so I'm not like going to those places often, but obviously gay pride, for example, is such an amazing event. And we go down the streets and we march and that's the spirit of the place. Everybody is just welcome to be his own. And I think once you are welcoming to everybody else, so you're way op more open minded about those topics and you can have those conversation and see other people reality where in different parts of the country, such as, for example, Nebrak, maybe 15 minutes drive of Tel Aviv, you go shirtless or you go exposing your sexuality too much and people will throw rocks on you. So we do also have this behavior exist. I guess there is radical people all over, especially when it comes to religion. Uh, but Tel Aviv is just the one of those places where I really didn't see much around the globe. And I've been, trust me, traveling. I mean, in Africa, I spent two years, I spent, I know all Latin America, I know North America, but Tel Aviv is just a place to be yourself, colorful as it gets, free and liberal as it gets, 
And I think it's a beautiful place to just be whoever you want to be. You know, one of the struggles we have in, in India at the moment is while the government may have decriminalized it, why people like me are okay, we're successful, we can move around. In our circles, what your sexuality is, is hardly of any consequence. It makes no difference to anybody. But small town India is a very different story. So if, say in Himachal, today, if there's a guy who is probably gay or bisexual, the reason I was interested in this conversation was because I think a lot of Indian people are almost sometimes looking for a safe haven to be able to go and explore themselves. And I think Tel Aviv, from whatever little I was reading, was it was literally touted as, as the LGBT-friendly capital in the world. Yeah. And I thought it was so liberating because for me to meet you and at a cafe and talk about my sexuality very open is a very normal cause for me. But that may not necessarily be the case, Omri, with a lot of Indian people. I know. Now, I, I'm curious to know, we are still at the baby steps of this country becoming more... We, we're very inclusive as a society. We were. And... Somewhere down the line, that changed. Tel Aviv became that gay-friendly now, or was that historically just the way it was? I'm not sure I can say historically, but it's been a few decades that Tel Aviv is moving to that direction. I mean, Tel Aviv now is basically, I don't know, 80% young people. You go down the street, you only see 20 years old. And some older families that live there for a long time, but mostly young people. And I think mentality have been changed a lot in the last few decades. So obviously, if you speak with your parents, they grew up on completely different values and things that today are very normal, even if it's like, I don't know, put eyeliner and, and dress like, you know, however you want. I'm not judging you. Um, but I think 20 years ago or 40 years ago, that would be like crazy. You're not going to do it. Actually, just yesterday I met this guy. He's also gay from Israel. Name gave us. Super nice guy. Um, and he grew up in Dimona in the south. And he told me that he, from very young, he was so afraid of exposing his sexuality. Obviously, he also said that he wasn't sure about his sexuality for until he was about past military or mid-military, which is about 18 to 20 years old. But still, he knew that something with him is not so let's say, normal. Although, you know, if it exists, it's normal. You have gay even with animals. I know I'm I'm animal photographer. I mean, you have animals that do sex between the same... Uh, uh, gender. Gender, yeah. So if it exists, it's normal. But just the perspective and the way that people were seeing this stuff earlier, in the earlier days, it was different. Um, so he grew up afraid of exposing his sexuality, but now in Tel Aviv, even if you're 14 years old, I guess you know that it's not that unnormal or crazy to be gay. It's just okay. You have some people that are gay and other that are not, and it's okay. So you feel more free about yourself, and obviously I guess it saves a lot of problem in the future, because when you grow up afraid of your identity, um, Basically, I, I guess later on you'll face some consequences for that because you'll be like, okay, so what I need to do with this hidden identity I have, then you're less connected to it. Um, each and every one of us, I guess, connected to his secret identity later on in his life. For example, I feel I grew up in a place where I couldn't really, um, I don't know, do what I like to do. I'm a nature guy. I like spending time in nature. I like go exploring the mountain. I didn't have it when I was younger. Only after the military, when I understand I'm free to go wherever I want and do whatever kind of crazy stuff I like to do. I want to ask you about the military because that's a very interesting point there because when I was reading up and honestly, I and I, and I should say this, I know very little about Israel. Whatever I know is from the news media. I don't trust it. So you'll have to pardon me sometimes if I ask you a question which is really ridiculous because sure, I may not know feel the free. answer. But the one interesting thing that I thought about Israel was the fact that even your military, first of all, from what I understand, I think everyone has to serve in the military. Well, that's also a topic we need to talk about. But do they have to? We have to, although sad enough these days our poor government uh, passed through few laws that actually allow religious people not to be part of the military. So you can pretty much just say, no, I believe in God now. I'm going to study the Bible. And instead of going and protecting your country, you would go to a room, do basically whatever you want, neither study or not, and the, the government will pay you for that. I think this is horrific, uh, but I guess it's not the topic we're on it. But No, it but I'm was, interested was to mentioned. know that. I'm interested to know because... Um, Look, you know, the one, the, 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 I basically, I'll tell you, the, I, we, I was at this vegan cafe and 
Omri was walking around and one of the reasons to also do the podcast is very often to understand just more of what you're saying. Of course. Now, my question actually in this case was just about the fact that in America, for example, with the military, they have a very strict don't ask, don't tell policy. They don't want to know if you're gay. Yeah. But apparently from what I understand in, in your military, that's not a question. And if you're a gay person and you're out, that in no way hinders your military capabilities from what I understand. Is that right? It's completely right. Yeah, I know many gay people that serves in the military. You know, obviously some people can be less or more open minded and the gay guy goes now to to the military, you know, it's it's kind of hard still because in the military you share the, the toilets and like the showers. So imagine if you're gay and I've heard those stories, you're going into the shower with your rest of the team and all of them are now naked. I guess it puts you in a bit uncomfortable position or where you want to be more a bit involved or I don't know. I, I imagine myself going in, in a shower with 20 ladies. I mean, I would be a bit like, okay, how I'm handling this situation. I mean, at this point, this almost feels like an incentive to join the military. If you're going to go in and all these guys are going to be naked, you're like, okay, I, this is my vibe. I like it. But it, you know, I, I always say that to people where um, I have some of my closest friends and who are straight. If you and I hang out a lot more, we could be buddies, all right? And But the thing about that is I don't think it works quite like that because you could be naked around me. But if you're not getting the same vibe from you, either I'm a creep and I'm hitting on you or I respect who you are. Yeah. And I think part of homosexuality also is to be able to draw that boundary and not of let course. other people feel uncomfortable. But I, but I can see the situation if I'm in a shower with very hot Israeli men who are all naked. <laughs> I mean, there is a chance where I might... I might, for all you know, I might be hard. I wouldn't know what to do about that. So yeah. you'd be like, bro, you're so hot. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I can understand that. But I, have you heard of people who had that issue, who had to navigate it? There must be some beautifully military romances. They could happen. There could be two gay boys who are in the military who fall yeah, in love. Yeah, Has yeah. that happened? Everything happens, of course. The military is so widespread that, you know, everybody basically, except what we just said about the religious people, goes to the military. Now, I guess you need to know yourself better. I mean, if you're gay and that might trigger you, which is super normal, you might not want to join. Um, to a combat unit where you have this very, very intimate uh, relation with your partners or to the team because you're spending all day long together. Training, showering, eating, sleeping, everything together. You're saying all this stuff which is sounding good. I know. I mean, the way you're saying it, a gay boy will be like, sign me up. <laughs> but it's a rough mission. It's not just, you know, it's not I hanging mean, around. Now you're saying things like training. rough and this is all sounding... <laughs> Okay, now from the from the religious perspective, I understand what you're saying. Now, uh, uh, you know, away from that, where you said yes, the, I think one of the biggest honors you can have is to be able to serve your country. My father, sure. my father was a military man. He was in the Indian Navy. I know what you're saying. For a lot of people, then to use the religious card is a very easy card to be able to get out of serving your nation. Yeah. Which, which in in a country which is as war torn as yours is right now, that would be seen as a almost as an act of cowardice. Would it be something where you would say you're you're almost chickening out? So that's the thing. Imagine Israel right now is actually very divided. We're never before we were so divided like we are today. So we really like the liberal part and then the religious part. Now, if you're liberal, obviously you see it as cowardice. You're like you're not taking part of of you know you're not carry the I don't know even how the to burden describe. of your country. I yeah, mean, you exactly. Want to, not the you burden, but the responsibility. Yeah, you have responsibility. There is not many countries around the world that's surrounded with enemies. We have enemies all over us. I mean, we have Lebanon. They don't like us. We have Hezbollah sitting there shooting rockets on daily basis. We have Hamas in Gaza border Egypt. We have this cold peace with Egypt, but they don't really like to help us much in everything that involves Hamas. We have uh, on the other side Jordan, and we have West Bank where a lot of terrorism also come, which is part of us. So it's really hard to manage a country where you have so many enemies from all frontiers and not everybody taking part trying to defend it. And moreover, even saying, no, I'm actually defending it. The fact that I'm praying to God, God saving us because of me, not because of you, that you will eventually die. So the one who was actually going to the military, they die on the sword, you know? They go, fight, and die. I can't share enough respect for those people. Actually, my very best friend almost died at the 7th of October. He got shot three times. He is a very strong man and I love him. Um, and he survived and he did amazing recovery. Um, but you know, not everybody did this recovery. Not everybody survived what happened. And not every, every day, just yesterday, five soldiers dead. Uh, the three days ago, another four soldiers died. So religious people, they're not gonna die praying 
God, you know, and if, if you really believe that praying God will help us, you're welcome to pray during the night and thank you for that, yeah? No, like, I don't uh, underestimate it, but please, you can also go to the military and take part of what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, if, if, if you ask a liberal guy, like a guy that lives in Tel Aviv, what do you think about the religious people that don't serve? He would be like, that's a shame, that's crazy, I don't know why we need to do that. And then they ask us for more time in the military, and it's just ridiculous. But then you go to Bnebrak again, or Jerusalem, where it's religious cities, and there the vibe will be completely different. The vibe will be, no, I'm not going to the military. I'm, I'm going to defend my country reading the Bible. And, and there you'd, you'd be coward if you would go to the military. You would consider like betraying your religion or betraying the moral of your society because they're almost like a society within a society. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very hard times where it really depends who you're asking um, and they will give you their own answer. Um, what is it really like when you're, when you're seeing the news in Israel when you and deeply excuse my ignorance uh, to someone like me who is still, I was a journalist with CNN, I have spent a lot of time reading, but even for me sometimes, and I know a lot of people can get triggered by this, I could also in a conversation get confused by Hamas, Gaza, Palestine, Jews, Arabs. When we see a lot of the news in the Indian media, very often we are listening to the whole narrative from an Indian perspective. Seldom are we really understanding what is happening. How do you really explain to an absolute novice what's happening in your country? That's very deep. So look, we are Jewish. Um, our ancestor grew up in Israel. We came from Israel. Israel is our home. We've been the Roman 2,000 years ago or so. They took us out from our country and we became nomads. We went spread it um, to North Africa or all over Africa, some even to South America, a lot to Europe, many also to Russia. Uh, I guess Central Asia and these places also seen some Jews, but not that much. Um, and then for 2000 years, we were just living abroad. Israel uh, been took over many, many different uh, countries that controlled it during the time. The last were the Romans, but never at all were Arabs or how can I even describe? Israel would ne was never before considered Palestine. Palestine is actually a term that the Romans put on that country because they knew the strong feeling the Jews have for Israel, so they decided to change the country's name to Palestine. Palestine source is not even Muslim or Arab or anything like that. Now, at past World War II, after the world seeing what happened to the Jews and we almost got extinct, six million of us died in, in the Holocaust, in, in concentration camps and whatnot by the hand of the Nazis, um, they understood the Jewish people need to have a place. Um, and then the United Nations took the opportunity because the, Brit the Britons were just coming, leaving Israel and actually leaving the country empty from control. So the UN decided to put, to divide Israel to two. It, Israel at that time were about, don't take my words for it, but I think maybe half a million Arab people and slightly less Jews. But there were more Arab people that time than Jews in the country. I can't say no, according to what I know, obviously. Um, they just, you know, by the time arrived to that area from neighboring country. So they said, okay, there are a lot of Arab people in the country. There are also Israel Jewish, and the Jewish need to have a place. And the Jewish kind of have their uh, historical right over the country. So let's take the country, divide it to two. We'll make a country for Israel. We'll make a country for the Arabs. Israelis, the Jews, were extremely happy about this decision. Imagine a day before that, we were dying at concentration camp in Europe. The next day, the UN offered us half of what was ours, half of Israel, happiest we could ever be. The Arabs said, uh, with a lot of pressure from the outside world, like Lebanon, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, whatever, I'm not super involved in what happened 100 years ago, I'm sorry, uh, but 
with the support of all the Arab countries uh, around Israel, they said, no, 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 no. We don't allow any Jews sector in our Middle East, only Muslim stretch. So they were like, okay, no, we don't want that. You refuse to the offer. We will back you up and start a war with the Jews. We'll eliminate the Jews and you'll take all the country and we'll have another Muslim country in the Middle East. God knows how. Jews fought with sticks and rocks and somehow won a fight against five different military, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and maybe Saudi Arabia, I, I think. Um, and then we won the fight. That was 48, May 48. And after we won the fight, we took control all over what we know today as Israel. As Israel. Now, the, the one thing that is very important to understand in this conflict, we are actually having conflict, conflict in front of somebody who doesn't believe in our existence. So the, the thing is, it's not what we're willing to give and what they're not willing to give. It's just they don't negotiate. For them, you don't have any right to be here. You don't have any right to exist. The only option is we, they take all Israel and we out, dead or escape somewhere or to the ocean. But there is no negotiation and there would never be actually because according to their religion, they don't believe that we need to coexist with them. So from 48 that we won the independent war till today, we had many more wars where Israel needed to defend herself from a lot of militaries, a young country, a small country that needs to defend herself in front of big armies, big countries that are way more, uh, you know, older, have more money. Well, at least those times when we were young. Now we're strong and capable of defending ourselves better. You know, um, that, that part is interesting as, as an Indian citizen for me because when I was reading up a little bit about your country yesterday, 1948 is when your statehood was formed. We became independent in 1947. These are, these are two countries which have a very similar uh, independent history in terms of timeline. I also know that our relationships with your country are fairly cordial, uh, from what I understand, which is probably why a place like Dharamkot, where we currently are, we're in Himachal, is almost like a safe haven for a lot of Israeli people to be here. You have a sense of community here. You know, when you talk about, when you talk about, you know, I had only learned in school about the chapters about the persecution of Jews. Um, again, I, I want to very clearly say I, I'm one of those people who believes if you don't know about a matter, it's best to stay quiet. I know very little about what you've gone through, but when I have learned and studied about the Jewish community, you have really had to fight tooth and nail simply to be always able to exist. Since and forever. Honestly, it's even said in our Bible that we will always live by the sword. I don't know how much I believe the Bible, honestly, but this is sort of a say we have. Israel will always live by the sword. We are always surrounded by enemies. And if we won't stay strong, strong enough to defend ourselves, we're just not going to be. I really don't think there is many countries around the world that on a daily basis needs to protect her own existence is not protect from this random guy who go stab someone or I don't know this, you know, very sad but small events. We really need to defend our existence. If we won't stay strong and stand on guard, Iran on the back door will, will eliminate us. And the funny thing is, none of our opponent, neither Iran, which is the one that control both Hamas and Hezbollah, would ever be like, no, no, we are good with them. We just want to talk with them or get to terms, you know. They will say out loud and clear, we want to eliminate Israel. We're working now on um, those um, weapons, sorry. Mis landmines. Not landmines, but um, atomic bombs. Okay. So they're working on atomic bombs for, I don't know, 30 or so even more years. And they'd say out loud, we work on atomic bomb because we want to bomb Israel. We want to eliminate Israel. Like their own existence is to eliminate Israel. They don't even focus of prosperity to their people. They don't, they don't mind the benefit of their people. Iran is our biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. But I know that until the 70s, before the Iranian regime took control, 
um, the, the one that controls today. We were friends with Iran. I met few Iranians traveling. They don't hate me. Iranian people don't hate me. And I don't hate them either, unless they hate me. But Iranian regime does hate me. He hates all Western civilization. And he tried to eliminate it. So how does he do it? By having his militias, his Hamas puppet, sitting in Gaza, sending them support of bombs and weaponry to eliminate us, same as Hezbollah, and they both sit on our border. Now, it's a very unfair game, because you have Hamas, which is a sort of, a not sort of, it's a fucking terrorist organization, sort of playing a guerrilla game, hidden in their own civilians behind the poor Gazan, which are poor, and I feel sorry for them, but many of them are really not innocent. They support Hamas, they help Hamas, but that's a, a different subject. Let's pretend or just say for now that many or most of the Gazans are super innocent, just civilians that want peace and don't mind much about Israel, want to have peace with us. Hamas takes advantage of that by hiding in hospitals, in hidden gardens, and actually using human as human shield, which is, I, I feel it's the lowest you can go, to hide under kids shoot rockets from their kitten garden and then when Israel in respond attack back no we're not just gonna be oh they shoot missiles we're gonna attack attack this place we know it's a kitten garden so we will send first flyers from 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 planes saying okay you have military base here we're gonna bomb it tomorrow please take all the kids and take all the innocent out what will Hamas do for the sake of propaganda and for the sake of showcasting the world that we are the bad guys, that we kill innocent children, women. The amount of time I've heard of it, people saying, oh, but there's women and children only. It's like we only fight women and children in Gaza. Everybody showcasting like Israel just trying to eliminate the women and children of Gaza. That's just not true. It's Hamas creating this reality where he hides and put his bunkers under hospitals and the most sensi sensitive places so he could showcase outside that we are just indiscriminately bombing, killing civilians, killing women, killing children. And that's horrific because... It's also horrific because we are also, this is also war in times of social media. This is all being filmed. This is all being shared. This is like you were telling me yesterday. There, again, on both sides, a lot of these attacks are not simply attacks where they could be doing whatever they're doing. They're making sure they capture it on camera to be able to create a narrative. What is that about? Because this warfare includes a camera. I mean, imagine you see a video. You, have, you don't know nothing about the video. You see a bomb falling on, on a building. First of all, how this guy knew to fucking put the camera to this building? Does he follow our military infrastructure? Know where we are about to bomb? Or maybe it's because we told him we're bombing it so they could take the civilian out so he knows to film it and they're showcasting like we're just bombing innocent that first second just a random uh, thing that happened at the very start of the war um, there was a very big uh, explosion in that hospital immediately all the news went out saying israel bombed the hospital more than 500 dead not even a day passed and we realized it was actually a bombed that supposed to go to Israel from Hamas, but one of the missiles failed on its course to Israel and fell down on Gaza on a hospital. It didn't even strike the hospital and there were less than 20 people died, fault of Hamas. But the news said it's Israel bombing a hospital and there are more than 500 people got killed. That's ridiculous. Then we saw also videos of Hamas shooting his own civilians. Hamas shooting his own civilians, his own brothers and sisters, just because they try to flee from war zones. So they don't want them to flee from war zone, zones because they want, to, again, to show how Israel bombing innocent. This is all part of the propaganda they try to, to make. Now, why would we ever bomb civilians. I mean, this war, we didn't start this war 
the war started at 7 of October when, f I don't know, four or 5,000 Hamas uh, terrorists invaded Israel, slaughtered everybody along the way. Now, just let me tell you this, and this is hard stuff to listen. When you do war, you need to know what you're aiming for. I, I was special forces in my military. I know how operation works, what you're aiming to, what you want to achieve. What Hamas did was not a military operation. They didn't aim to kill soldiers. They didn't aim to destroy our defenses system or to do anything like that. They just tried to make us go crazy. So they invaded, invaded villages and they raped women. And after they finished raping the women, they cut their head off. And then they took babies and they put them in the oven and baked them in the oven. And then they took a whole families and they slaughtered them one by one when the others are watching and they raped girls in front of their fathers and mother. And I'm sorry, it's shit to say, but I need to say it out clear. They did the most unthinkable things to do. And they not just did it, but they actually also filmed it on camera. They filmed it on camera and left the camera there so we could watch. Now you tell me, why would do why would you do such a thing? If you just try to fight for your freedom, whatever they try to say there, just to, I don't know, release Israel or the Palestine, whatever they call Palestine is, never existed in the history, I'm sorry. But if that was your actual goal, you're not spending time raping young, young women in front of their father and, and filming it. This was just to upset us to the very point where we will be losing our mind, where our security feel that is not existing, where everybody is afraid for their life, where everybody thinks that tomorrow a terrorist can come to your home and rape you in front of your family, slaughter you and, and shame your body later. That's all happened just so we will respond in very, very intense way as we did and I'm glad for it. And then they should they will showcast again outside how supposedly bad we are. Now, how can we be the bad where day before 7 of October, the 6th of October, actually another one of my best friends at the 6th of October, he got married. We had the most amazing evening. And I was actually the one that, that put this marriage together. Like I, I, I was reading um, under the chupa and everything. It was... Oh, it's such a great day for me also. I, I was feeling part of this wedding and I had the best time of my life dancing with all my friends. And then we stayed sleeping in the middle of the desert, all of us, after a, a really amazing night, just to wake up two hours after we went to sleep or after party, you know. And what happening? There's rockets and, and the news saying that, it, that Israel been invaded from, from Gaza. And like people, like what happened? We, we were, we didn't have a war the day before, but the war just forced on us at a single day, 6.30 in the morning, 7 of October, they invaded Israel. And since we're in a war. So the war started because they wanted the war to start. And if I know right, I know that the motive behind that war, obviously, like everything that happened around the globe is money issues. So if you really want to know what's happening, you must follow the money. And if you follow the money in this case, you realize that the ones that are involved are Hamas and Iran. Iran sponsored Hamas. Iran didn't like the fact that Israel is about to achieve a peace agreement, an historical peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. And this peace agreement would bring... Uh, the opportunity of building new pipes of, uh, of gas, leading gas and oil from Saudi Arabia part towards the Western world, going through Israel. Iran knew that if this pipe would build, um, with the help of the agreement that uh, is happening between Israel and Saudi Arabia, they will badly uh, lose money and, you know, their income will actually... Uh, be affected by it because they're the ones sponsoring most of the West gas today with the Russia pipes. 
So they decided to do something. How, how would they stop this agreement? They would tell Hamas to attack Israel, make Israel go freaking wild, crazy, angry, needs to now uh, respond to Hamas. And then they'll create this propaganda showcasting because it's easy. Obviously, we are a million times stronger than Hamas. If, let me say it out loud. If Israel wanted this war to be over, the war could be over by the 8th of October, the next day. We have enough weaponry, we have enough military to eliminate Gaza in a blink of an eye. So trying to show the world that we're killing innocent, and you know, we're eight months already just killing women and children, just killing women and children because we like killing women and children. Try to show this to the world. It's, it's not even ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. Because if that's what we wanted to do, by 8th of October, there would be no one left alive in Gaza Strip. So when people tell me genocide, genocide, I'm just like, you guys need to shut the fuck up. You know nothing about genocide. Genocide is what happened in the Holocaust where they slaughtered 6 million Jews in few years and they did it the fastest they can, undiscriminately, everybody, gas chamber, shooting them in the head, just killing them. With today weaponry, saying that we do genocide is, come on, genocide would be puff and we have a genocide, it's just a press of a button. And we could do a genocide. So if we wanted to do the genocide, the genocide would be over by 8th of October. We're eight months later, still losing soldiers just because we go house by house, investigating, trying to take care of innocent or supposedly innocent and trying to only eradicate terrorism. And the one who are not terrorists, the one who are not part of the conflict, we try to help him, we try to help him evacuate. But obviously some dying along the way, sometimes there is no other option. For example, a week ago we had this amazing um, act where we managed to release four hostages. Now just try to imagine, this is, this is movie right there. Hostages in the middle of Gaza, which is, imagine, I don't know, Delhi, but the worst part of Delhi, where the density is the worst, okay, in Gaza. We sending our very best soldiers, our, our special units, we sending them to suicide mission. So they can try and take out hostages. Along the way, some innocent civilians, which I don't know if they're so innocent, if they are next to where hostages are, where Hamas militias are, Hamas bases. And we try to get out our hostages from there at any cost because that's what the country should do. And like, fuck, if I would be hostage and my country wouldn't do anything to bring me out. So what, what did I even serve the country for? And then we realized that those four hostages, for example, were held by nonetheless Al Jazeera journalist that was hiding them in their basement. The same people that we say are innocent civilians, the same people who were escorting Hamas on October 7 to get everything on camera, to get Hamas slaughtering babies on camera and raping women on camera, those same people hiding terrorists, the world sees them as innocent civilians. And when we do that and releasing those hostages, the world still comes to us and say, oh, but don't you think the cost of, of killing those innocent civilians trying to release your hostages is too much? Now you tell me what am I supposed to do? Leave my civilian abandoned in, 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 this, in Gaza in, as hostage? Die there, rotten in, 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 in the worst? I, I can't put words to it, I'm sorry. And I then... See. The world still come to us commenting on every step we're doing because this is how propaganda works. But your country also does get a lot of support. 
We do, but you do. the support... It's, but, and the, the bright side about this conflict, and there is never a bright side to really any conflict, but in this case, uh, I don't think your country has been marginalized. I think you've also got a lot of Western support, which you get. I know India uh, is a very strong ally, from what I politically understand. You have served in the military. How long was that for? Three years. Um, what is that like? Are you... I'm always... I, where, do you, where do you live? What do you eat? Um, I'll, I'll tell you. I always, I always put um, military service. I, I ask someone, what was like the, the hardest thing you've done? Maybe you've climbed a very steep mountain. When you climb, for, a, for example, a very steep mountain, you're not necessarily enjoying the process. The process is difficult. You're pretty much suffering along the way. You have a lot of sweat. It's painful on your back. Your legs are shaking. It's a long walk. But when you reach the summit, it's wor worth it. When you reach the summit, when you're after the military and you look back at everything you did, you feel you, you're proud. And I feel the military have changed me to a point where I'm able to be who I am right now. I've been traveling the world for seven years. Most of them were by my own. I don't think I could do it if I didn't have this self-confidence of I know I I can take care of myself. I know I, I could help myself in any situation. The military pretty much, you know, it doesn't bring you to a point where you're now a martial artist. You can't do that in three years where most of them, you, you want the guy actually to be on the field, not training. So you have this, I had uh, one, uh, one year and three months of, uh, of training and then I was... Uh, and and so like in, in India, we've got the army, there's the navy, there's the air force, you know, three wings of the military. There's the supplementary coast guard. Yeah. Um, which, which was the wing that you were a part of? Which was... I was uh, special forces that uh, were focusing on very dense city area. Um, have you had to, have you, in, in defense of your country, have you, have you taken a life? Have you killed someone? Have you killed an infiltrator? Um, um, my, dad, my dad used to tell me stories where they did something called the Sri Lanka operation where, um, where India was um, helping Sri Lanka and I remember he was part of the intelligence service so he, they would dress up as fishermen and you know exactly what you're saying. As part of warfare, very often the military will disguise itself as civilians yeah. which is very much happening in your country. It's only, you know, the narrative is so different when I hear it from our perspective when you say we had Indian military personnel blending in to sort of help the Sri Lankans, but exactly when I hear it the other way around, I can see the conflict there. Now, when you're in a situation where you come head on head with someone who is an infiltrator, who is a terrorist, who are, you know, because the narrative on both sides is different, right? Yeah. Um, we always talk about this so much in the Indian media where you talk about the fact that if we've had in military personnel who've been killed, we talk about the fact that they've been martyred. At the same time, when you talk about the fact that we may have killed some of the terrorists, we talk about the fact that these terrorists have been killed. The language is different on both sides for sure when you have been at the forefront of anything like that have you had a hand to hand combat have you had to kill people how do you defend your nation was there a physical um, experience you've had about dealing with outsiders yeah of course many of them my my unit is basically the most active unit uh, in 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 the military we operate on the west bank west bank is uh, the actually eastern part of Israel, it's the West Bank of Jordan, was part of Jordan before. Um, but this sector, it's supposedly part of Israel, but not completely part of Israel. It's a higher ground where most of the people living there are Muslims or, or considering themselves Palestinians. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, Hamas uh, going on there, let's say. Now, almost every night during my military service, we needed to go out and to arrest someone, um, sometimes even to shoot someone, uh, but not many times we're going on a mission where you need to kill someone. Kill. For example, in 2014, we had this war called Sukaitan, where uh, three 16 years boys uh, got kidnapped in the middle of the day, in the middle of the road. There was a car stopping, putting those three poor guys on the car, killing them, kidnapping them. We didn't know if they'd been killed at that time. I don't know exactly how long after they'd been kidnapped, they'd been killed and then burned. I don't know if they'd been burned alive or I don't know how it was. We found their bodies burned two months later. Um, but only that operation, for example, after two months, when we had the indication where those terrorists were, the one who kidnapped the kids, that was the only operation I was part of where we'd been sent out 
knowing that no matter what, if we see this and this guy, even if they raise their hand, I don't know what, we shoot them to death because what they did. The rest, we try not to shoot and not just not to shoot. We have very strict rules about how and when you're allowed to shoot. I shoot at someone, but I didn't kill him because at that moment where I needed to shoot him because otherwise he would have been attacking me. I had this single moment of being able to think through it and I knew that I have the opportunity now to kill him or to shoot his leg. And I chose to shoot his leg because I've seen his face and I didn't want to take this responsibility to the rest of my life. And I'm glad that I did this decision. I don't know what happened to the guy later, but I shoot his leg. Um, then the rest of the operation, you most of the time you just try and take the guy to investigate. So you get this uh, from the intelligence. They tell you this and this guy lives there and there. You need to arrest them. Uh, you go there, try to go there as silently as you can. So you're not going to make noise and uh, alarming actually the neighbors, which are innocent civilians that immediately when they'll see uh, militaries they'll throw rocks on us or burn tires and throw them on, on us or I don't know fucking throw fridges off roofs uh, sad enough two or three years ago a guy from my unit got killed because they throw a gigantic rock off the roof fell on his head um, so these are kind of the innocent civilian we're talking about living in these areas um, but yeah, operations sometimes can be very, very uh, brutal and sometimes it could be actually, let's call it okay, when you manage to enter very silently, only enter the house, nobody knows and you can surprise the terrorist in his bed. You put your hand on his mouth and you take him outside and nobody's going to hear it and he just disappeared. So this can happen if the opportunity, if the operation was very successful. If not, sometimes there are problems on the way out. They try to block the road. They try to throw things at you. Sometimes they have weaponry. They shoot you. So things can go both ways. When, he, when I look at India and our perspective, we um, are our neighbors. We've got Pakistan, which was a part of India. So that's, that's a different story. We've got Nepal. We've got Bhutan. We've got China. On the southeast, we've got all these Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, we've got Sri Lanka. We've had wars with China. We've had wars with Pakistan. Um, but today, if I meet an, if a Pakistani citizen, we are collaborative. Uh, I don't think as people we hate each other. In fact, we play cricket together. There's a lot of music. A lot of our music uh, sort of goes back and forth. China has a lot of market in this country. Also, we've been very far away from wars. Yeah. I don't think there's actual hatred between citizens. Your situation is very different. I'm very curious to know if you meet someone who is Palestinian, what is your reaction? Are you able to differentiate the person from the state or you're not at that point yet because it's too soon? Okay. We have Israel. In Israel, we have, as I said, the West Bank and we have Gaza. Gaza has two, around 2 million Palestinian. I guess... You, first of all, you're never going to meet anyone from Gaza. They don't cross border to us and we don't cross border to them. Gaza has its own territory. We left Gaza in 2005, which is also very funny because you'd hear how Gaza is an open air prison, which is ridiculous because just look at the map. Just look at the map and you'd see Gaza is actually bordering Egypt. The one that's making Gaza an open air prison is Egypt, not Israel. But let's move forward. People from Gaza, you won't be able to speak or be friendly or you're not going to meet them. Then people from West Bank, most of them will be a bit more aggressive, we'll say. Uh, you also have a bit less interaction with them. But then you have what's actually considered Israel. And within our borders, we still have over 2 million Arab people living. Mm -hmm. Those people live in peace with us. In fact, for example... I live in a village called Chagor in central Israel, bordering many, many other um, Arab uh, um, like villages and stuff. I have a the lady that works at my mother's house for over 20 years, um, and, and she, she's Palestinian, and she, she's Arab, well, not Palestinian, I know some, uh, they call themselves this way. Um, and we're okay with it. I, I know many Arab people that I'm very good with, 
most of the Arab people that live in Israel, they are very well know, know that they don't have any better place to go in Iran, for example, and that will bring us to the start of the conversation, if you'd go to Iran and say you're gay, you'd be slaughtered. If you'd go to Iran as a woman, you have no rights. You're actually a property of your husband if you have one. Um, so Arab in Israel, they have the best rights of all the Arab countries neighboring us. And they love to be part of Israel. Um, and they could become doctors, they could go to universities, they could make decent money, they can work, um, they can serve the country not as a military because we don't want them to actually, you know, now face their own brothers and, and families from the other side of the country, but, but they do support our country, some of them, not all of them, some of them are really not so nice and they're brainwashed to think that they should hate us, which is stupid because again, they received, they're receiving the best condition to live um, from any Arab next to, even from Egypt or Jordan or Lebanon, Syria, which is in war or like, you can just look about how many Arab countries around the world now are in war, how many of them gay, give gay, gay rights, zero, how many of them uh, give women rights, pretty much also zero. Um, because but, your country is in the Middle East, it is, and by absolute understanding, it is considered the most liberal nation 100%. within that spectrum. 100%. You have no other country around us that give any of the rights that we give to minorities like Israel does. We hug and embrace everyone. Lastly, before we wrap up. When you look at our conflicts with our, with our countries, we've got Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Uh, but to be honest with you, I think the three, the three neighbors, China, India, and Pakistan right now, I think we're all at a point where we don't want a war. India, in any case, has always been at the forefront of non-alignment. In fact, if I'm not wrong, even recently we went out and said, even with the Ukraine-Russia war, we don't want to necessarily participate because we don't want war. Uh, the non-alignment movement, India was a very big part of it. And I think we've continued the policy. Um, for but, but we sort of know where there is a conflict. We know a resolution. We know... For example, China controls a lot of the part which is called Aksai Chin, where we are simply trying to make sure that they go back. And China is known to be imperialistic, or they, they, you know, they take parts of our natural Pradesh and do all of that. In your case, um, if there was simply a resolution, which of course is the silliest question, because if it was there, they would have done it by now. But if you had to encapsulate what is it that Israel wants for this to be over, what would that be? And I know the reason we say this is because we know what it is. It's not happening is the problem. But what is it? So at the past, there were a few attempts by presidents. So at some, at some point of history, um, Palestinian leaders could have said, OK, we just want back uh, West Bank, which was uh, belonged to Jordan before 67, which is a different war we've had. And you just give us the West Bank so we could build our own state there and we will have peace with you. And at few points of the history, um, our president were like, you know what, okay, what, what you want? What you want to have peace? Let's, let's talk what you want. And they would say, okay, we want this, this, this and that. I think, I don't remember, maybe about 20 years ago it was, our president decided he gives them everything they want. So he took all their condition and 98% of what they were asking, 98% of the territories they've asked, he was like, okay, that would be yours. Everything will be handled to you. That is yours. Build your own country. All I need is a sign for you to no longer fight with us, that we now have peace. And they refused. Why? Again, we mentioned it before. We're facing, we're facing leaders, hopefully, I, I'm, it will be hard for me to say citizen because I don't want to believe that all the citizens in West Bank, neither Gaza, want to eliminate me. It's a hard thought. But we're facing leaders and and actually forces, which is Hamas, Hezbollah, the one we're negotiating, Palestinian authorities, that don't believe in our existence. And this is the source of the conflict. This is why there is no sight, a solution in sight. Because until the point they will receive the fact that Israel is there to stay, that Israel is a state, that, that, that we're just there. You can't move us from there. There is no option where you take everything. You want to talk? You want to talk about how we can coexist? We can talk. 
But until the time you, you, you will arrive to that understanding where it's neither we keep fighting forever and ever or we will sit down and talk about how we can coexist, we won't be able to move forward. And right now we're still in a place where the other side don't accept our existence. And this is a very, very difficult place to be. You mentioned the Pakistani, uh, Chinese, Indian um, conflicts. The thing in these conflicts that I, I think, okay, I'm not very aware about what happened there, but these days you don't, you no longer have any territory no. issues. It's very well known that this territory belongs to India and this one belongs to Pakistan and this one belongs to China. So but that's actually not true because on our maps, in fact, there's a huge uh, international map which is very different from the map that we show, from the map that China shows, from the map that Pakistan shows. Uh, but that's exactly what I said. Sitting in India, I only know that much about Israel. Yeah. It's the same way from an Israeli perspective. Right. And I'm sorry for and, and, and that's and that's valid because which is why conversations like this really help. Our soldiers are battling, protecting our own territory in in the north. But again, the Pakistani narrative, the Chinese narrative, the Indian narrative will be all different. Guess which narrative I I subscribe to is the Indian narrative where of they are course. taking our country. But you know the reason I first of all apologize if I've asked you any question today which may have been silly, stupid. No, uh, no. Because I don't know it, you know. Of course. And I think that's the reason. And that's why I really, actually, I was happy when you invented, invited me to the podcast because I thought it's the best time actually to talk about this subject and to, to actually show the world what's really happening. Because I've been seeing people putting up Instagram posts and stories and my question to most people is, do you really know what's happening? And I don't, I, when people say, why don't you show support to either, either side? My answer always is, I don't know enough to have a support. And I think the worst thing we can do is to propagate, like I've heard your story. And war is never good for anyone. There are no winners in war. There are people just dying. Nothing good comes out of it. But you have to do what I love about um, when I was speaking to you yesterday also. I, I love how deeply passionate you were. And I don't know if I understand truly what you've told me. I don't know how much of it is. A lot of what you're telling me is from your perspective. But what I do admire about you and I deeply respect is just your <coughs> absolute love for your motherland. Of course. And I think... Um, we only have one. And it's a very small one. It's always a salute to a patriot. Because if you love your country the way you do, they're lucky to have you. Thank you, brother. All right. Bye-bye, Big Pucci. Happy to be here. Thank you. You're okay? Yeah, bro. It was amazing.